up on lawmakers. The Senate passes tort reform legislation after a lengthy debate. Governor Sonny Perdue encourages state agency heads to remain fiscally frugal. And firefighters from across Georgia come to the Capitol. Those stories and more are next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers for Tuesday, February 1st. Here are your anchors, Gerald Bryant and Wandy Lawson. Good evening, everyone. Also on tonight's program, the National Federation of Independent Businesses comes to the Capitol to hear more about the governor's small business initiative. And a Senate Appropriations Subcommittee gets a head start in the FY0506 budget, but our top story tonight is tort reform. That much-debated legislation passed the Senate today. Senate Judiciary Chair Preston Smith, who sponsors Senate Bill 3, believes this version of the bill, which includes caps for non-economic damages, is the best way to slow down skyrocketing insurance rates. David Zelsky joins us live from the Capitol with details. David. Thanks, Gerald. The debate began this morning with a motion to engross that passed, but with heavy opposition from the Democratic minority. You members who care about the Bill of Rights you better watch out, because they've been stomped all over today. We heard a lot of stories about business and about economy and about keeping Georgia open for business. What did we hear about the 10 people who had jury verdicts in excess of a million dollars? Show me the person who had a jury verdict in excess of a million dollars where it wasn't worth it. In 1992, there were 8 million people who had jury verdicts in excess of a million dollars. In 2001, there were 12 human beings that had jury verdicts in excess of a million dollars. Folks, you don't even get to the jury if you don't have a case. Who tells their stories? Did you hear their stories today? Did you hear what happened to them today? Now we've got to stop this train. It may be ideal to have an unfettered jury award, but the practical reality is there's no neurosurgery care in certain parts of our state. We're losing OB care in other parts of our state. That's the reality. And so while it's ideal to have a system where everyone gets as much money as they can possibly uh, be awarded by jury is ideal, it may not in practical reality work if we're losing access to health care in our state. Now, when the senators came to their desks this morning, they found a pledge from MagMutual, the state's only malpractice insurer, which stated if Senate Bill 3 passes, they will reduce their rates by 10 percent. Reporting live, I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. David, before you go, remind us of the current status of Senate Bill 22, the insurance reform bill. Senate Bill 22 is uh, actually awaiting discussion in, discussion in the Senate Insurance and Labor Committee, and it's been going on for just about a week now. Thanks, David. Now we have more from today's tort reform debate. Even before the tort reform debate began, there was heated discussion over whether the bill should be engrossed, meaning no amendments would be allowed. Democrats protested engrossment of Senate Bill 3, saying it silenced minority opinion. The bill's sponsor said the last tort reform debate in the Senate made the case for voting to engross. Here's a sample of that debate. The amendments that were offered time and time again on the floor of this chamber would have destroyed and killed any effort at civil justice reform altogether. I want to appeal to the members to do it differently this year. Experience has taught us that there are certain bills that are not well perfected on the floor of the Senate, that we should respect the committee process and use that committee process for the purpose of perfecting these bills and not to destroy good bills on the floor of this chamber. We've heard a lot of talk about the committee process, but if you listen very carefully, you heard I, 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 I incorporated this, I, I, I. It was not a committee, a true committee process. When I submitted an amendment, met the 24-hour requirement, and it was denied. And I was told some bogus reason about it not being properly drawn. And if you think your leadership elected you, you better take another look. Like parking. The people sent you here. And you need to remember that this morning when you are given the option of shutting down the debate or leaving it up for a debate. The will of the majority shall prevail. The rights of the minority are not being protected. It's wrong. 
The vote to engross the bill was 29 to 25, and as you saw earlier, the tort reform bill, Senate Bill 3, passed after three hours of debate. Governor Purdue outlined his legislative agenda at his quarterly department head meeting this morning. He also gave good news about the projected financial growth of the state. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman was at that meeting this morning, and he's standing by live with more. Jesse. Well, thank you, Nwandi. Governor Purdue gave the good news first. He expects the state to grow financially by 6%, as much as $850 million. But, he added, he expects department heads to continue to be conservative with their finances. He also warned them to be ready to turn in financial reports for the current fiscal year as soon as September. He wants to file the state's complete report by the end of the calendar year. Governor Purdue challenged agency heads to remain fiscally frugal in the coming year at this morning's meeting. He also celebrated his environmental conservation bill's passage in the House. We think it has an opportunity to leverage itself in a way that continues to grow way past the $100 million range and uh, gather private sector support as well as local government support as we go forward in, uh, in that. It's been widely acclaimed by our conservation and environmental groups. The governor also took the opportunity to outline much of his legislative agenda. Priorities include passing ethics reform, passing his Faith and Family Service Amendment, limiting the ability of spammers to send unsolicited email, as well as blocking cell phone companies from selling numbers to telemarketers. The governor also wants to streamline the Department of Motor Vehicle Safety. And when it came to budget concerns, Purdue decided to accentuate the positive. While some economists... Uh, uh, believe that we may see a downturn. We're still projecting about 6% growth that uh, will put in about $850 million. And one part of the governor's agenda may be on the Senate floor as soon as this week. The resolution that would provide for the Faith and Family Services Amendment to the state constitution was given a due pass in the Senate Rules Committee yesterday. It could be put on the calendar sometime this week. The resolution passed the Senate last year. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Thank you very much, Jesse. Meanwhile, the senior vice chancellor of the State Board of Regents says enrollment growth money recommended by Governor Purdue will allow Georgia colleges and universities to grow. Tom Daniel testified today before the budget subcommittee of the Senate Higher Education Committee. This is the most critical item in the university system's budget. As you well know, these are the funds that, that the university system will use to meet our enrollment growth. Uh, this $103.4 million is based on a 5.7 percentage increase in our enrollment, uh, and as well as an operating expenses of bringing on uh, 874,000 square feet of new space. Vice Chancellor Daniel also reported that $65 million in capital money will be a big help in repairing and renovating many of the older college and university buildings. Also testifying at today's subcommittee meeting, Mike Vollmer, Commissioner of the State Department of Technical and Adult Education. Vollmer said his department wants to move to performance-based budgeting. We made a commitment to the governor that we have been funded historically on enrollment growth. And we want to move into performance-based funding, meaning it's nice to give us money for every head that we bring through our institutions, but how are we doing with those heads? Are we retaining them? Are we graduating them? And then are we placing them in careers? So what we want to move into is performance-based budgeting over the next 12 to, to 18 months. Commissioner Vollmer also said DTAE will begin charging students a $35 instructional fee in the fall of 2005. He said that would raise $9 million. Small business owners gathered at the Capitol for the National Federation of Independent Businesses Small Business Day. Nearly 13,000 small business owners from across the state are members of the NFIAB. Lawmakers Chris Knight joins us live from the Capitol where Governor Sonny Perdue spoke to the group earlier today. Chris. In Wandy, Governor Purdue said small businesses are the backbone for the state's economy. And today, the governor took the time to update the NFIB on what he's doing to help small businesses in the state. It's a good opportunity for me to uh, uh, tell you all the progress we're making, I think, on small business issues. Governor Sonny Perdue addresses members of the National Federation of Independent Businesses as part of their 15th annual Small Business Day at the Capitol. The NFIB is a small business advocacy organization and we support legislators based on their small business votes. 
The governor spoke to the group about his initiatives that aim to promote small business growth across the state, including the Regulatory Flexibility Act, which protects small businesses from excessive regulation mandates. Where government intentionally or inadvertently uh, trips you up with non common sense rules and regulations, burdens and expenses, we want to sweep those away. We want to get them out of the way so you can focus on growing your businesses, growing jobs, and growing Georgia. The governor has recognized that, you know, if you want Georgia to grow, you've got to. You know, you got to tend the, the garden, uh, and that's basically the small businesses in Georgia. And in addition to listening to the governor's comments on small businesses, the NFIB also encouraged legislators today to support Senate Bill 3, the tort reform legislation that did indeed pass the Senate. Reporting live, I'm Chris Knight for Lawmakers. Thanks, Chris. Before you go, you mentioned the impact of small businesses on the state's economy. About how many small businesses are there here in Georgia? Well, and Wandy, according the, to the NFIB, the state is comprised of nearly 200,000 small businesses. All right. Thanks so much, Chris. And several other items from the Capitol. Senate Republicans will try again this year to get a constitutional amendment passed protecting the right to hunt and fish. If a bill passed by Representative Gene Maddox is passed, sheriff's elections in Georgia would become nonpartisan. Representative Mary Margaret Oliver has introduced legislation that would extend early voting in Georgia. It's currently one week. The bill would make it two weeks. And a hearing on Senate Bill 5 was scheduled today. That measure creating public-private partnerships for building projects like roads and schools is getting a lot of attention. The hearing was postponed because Economic Development and Tourism Committee Chairman Jeff Mullis could not be there. Senator Mullis' mother passed away. We at lawmakers extend our sympathies to the Mullis family. The General Assembly yesterday announced a rare Saturday session to be held March 12th. Citizens will be invited to observe the legislature as outdated laws are removed from the books. Earlier I talked to Representative Tyrone Brooks who is sponsoring a repeal of segregation era laws. When I was elected in 1980, in my first legislative session, I saw a representative from DeKalb County. Her name was Representative Eleanor Richardson. She brought a package of bills that would purge uh, many bad things from our code and constitution. Some of those things pertain to women who were denied the right to vote and many remnants of those laws uh, uh, dating back to the pre-days of suffrage. Uh, she repealed many of those and indicated to me that she thought she was getting all of the Jim Crow laws. We passed them in 1981, uh, but for some reason, some of those that we thought we'd gotten remain in our code. Uh, last June, however, Ernie Suggs from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution called me to let me know that uh, based on this study from the University of Arizona, there were still some in our code. From June until December, we researched the code and we found four more. We've introduced legislation to address those four, House Bill 25, 26, 27, and 28. We think, uh, based on our research, that this will cleanse the Georgia Code of any remaining Jim Crow laws, and I just hope we can do it uh, very quickly, get it behind us, uh, at least by March 12th. Well, let's talk specifically about what some of those are. People may be surprised to find out what some of these segregation codes that do remain on the books. Well, surprisingly, we still have laws on the books that would allow the governor to close down schools that would integrate, schools that would bring African-American children and white children together in one educational setting. We have uh, one on the book that would allow uh, uh, teachers who would leave the public school system and go to private segregation academies. They would be allowed to receive state grants, state funds, uh, to supplement their salaries, to, to really uh, supplement their retirement uh, pensions. Uh, one, of course, that would allow these private segregation academies to receive monies directly through the appropriation process, through the governor's uh, uh, special fund that he controls. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling that in 2005, that when you're talking back to the days of Jim Crow and segregation, that, you know, even today we would have to be uh, going through the code, going through our Constitution, to find remnants of uh, legalized segregation, legalized apartheid uh, here in, in the state of Georgia. Well, now, assuming that these measures will pass on March 12th or by March 12th and that you do have bipartisan support on these bills, where does Georgia stand in terms of some of the future race relation laws that we need to look at and where, where do we need to go from here? I would hope that going forward as a state, Georgia would embrace the concept of uh, setting up a statewide uh, reparations commission to look at the effect of slavery and the effect of Jim Crow on the African-American community. I also believe that we as a state should address the issue of racial profiling. 
Uh, one of the most heinous things you can do is profile a person because of their race, because of their gender, or because of how they look. Uh, and I think uh, Georgia, you know, as a state, we should do that. But I think this, this represents where I think we ought to be going as a state. And these items, if we could get them adopted, would send a strong message to the people of this state and the people of this nation and the world that Georgia is truly moving forward as one, uh, regardless of race, creed, or color. All right, Representative Tyrone Brooks, thank you so much for that update. Thank you. This reminder, for those of you with access to the Internet, you can watch lawmakers online. Visit our website at gpb.org for more information. Click on Watch Online, then follow the instructions for watching live or looking at past lawmakers' programs in our archives. That website address again is gpb.org, just another way we keep you apprised of what's going on at the Georgia General Assembly. And we'd like to recommend another website that's a valuable resource for information about the Georgia General Assembly. Go to www.legis.state.ga.us. That website is a great research tool that we here at lawmakers use on a regular basis. In the Senate Regulated Industry Committee today, advocates were allowed to express their views on whether the state could benefit from a comprehensive energy plan. Speakers from the private sector as well as government agencies gave their input to which committee, which is chaired by Senator Mitch Sebaugh. Even he recognizes that economic development, reliable and affordable energy, and a healthy environment have all been an essential part of Georgia's tremendous growth and prosperity in the past. But that growth and prosperity has brought us challenging air quality and water supply problems that EPA and the rest of Georgia now face it. We will need to pay special attention to those areas of the state that already face air and water challenges. Georgia needs a long-term, statewide energy plan and supporting policy framework that will support EPD in meeting and maintaining air quality standards and in providing reliable and adequate supplies of clean water. Georgia needs a long-term statewide energy plan and supporting policy framework that guides EPD in providing air, land, and water resources needed for electricity generation for Georgians first, before we permit private power plants that sell their electricity to consumers in other states. Georgia needs a long-term statewide energy plan and supporting policy framework that will work in tandem with, with the state's economic and environmental planning efforts to ensure a prosperous and sustainable Georgia far into the future. EPD stands ready to join the General Assembly, the Governor's Office, our sister agencies, the energy community, and other stakeholders to begin that work. Thank you. Now, the majority of advocates speaking encouraged the state to form an energy plan that would shape legislative policy on energy and also offered to help in shaping that policy. Well, the House Education Committee today took a crash course in Quality Basic Education, or QBE. That's the funding formula for Georgia schools. State School Superintendent Kathy Cox explained that recent economic downturns have not allowed many local systems to lower class sizes. I don't think there's a short-term solution right now to the class size problem because it really is a funding issue. And as you talk to the folks lining this room right now, they will tell you about how difficult the finances at the local level have been as our state has seen that economic downturn for the last two to three years. We're not out of the woods yet either. So I think that the, the rationale for the delay is really coming from the folks in the field who say w they can't afford it right now. So I think there's, there's really two, two things we've got to address and I think our education finance task force, we've got to look at a realistic model for how to go down the road with reduction of class size and give ourselves some leeway when we do hit these hiccups in the economy. Because I'll tell you, if we had stayed the course on, on the class size reduction, we would have bankrupted most of our, our small to medium sized systems in our state. One third of the state budget is spent on K-12 through education. QBE provides a guide as to the teacher-student ratio at each grade level. Kindergarten classes are 11 to 1. In grades 1 to 3, the ratio is 17 to 1. Grades 4 to 5 move up to 23 to 1. The ratio is also 23 to 1 for middle grade students, and high school classes are also funded for the 23 students for each teacher. Students who require extra attention of an individual education plan are slated for classes with a ratio of 11 to 1. At 
all grade levels um, and classes for severely disabled children can be as small as three to one. But these numbers address class size funding, not maximum class sizes. Local systems can exceed these numbers at certain grade levels if they lower class sizes in others. A coalition of poor, mostly rural school systems has filed suit against the state, claiming that the QBE funding formula penalizes districts with small tax bases. And the governor has appointed an education task force to collect public input and develop a new funding formula. Today, the Senate Insurance and Labor Committee held a public hearing on Senate Bill 76. That legislation would change the way medical malpractice insurance rates are filed at the Department of Insurance. Senator Judson Hill, author of the bill, explains. I think it's time to begin discussions on reforms in the affordability of insurance in Georgia and to ensure that the insurance companies remain accountable. And if this bill is passed, um, it will add medical malpractice rate filings to that list of other rates uh, that include the automobile insurance rates and move it away from the file and use system currently employed and to the uh, prior approval standard. Alan Hayes, Deputy Commissioner of Insurance, spoke against the bill. He says implementing the prior approval standard would not affect insurance rates. He also added that if the tort reform legislation does not pass, increasing rate regulations would in fact deter new insurance companies from doing business in the state. We think that that this bill won't have a great deal of effect on insurance rates um, because, and having said that it's it's like a more of a file and use system, the commissioner has so many other regulatory tools to use uh, against a company that it's very very rare that a company would uh, go ahead and use a rate that they filed without his approval. And that's just the way the system works today. Um, having said that, the commissioner's position on this bill is that. Um, Without tort reform, that this bill would actually hurt our MedMal rates probably in Georgia. So what we'd do, it would send a message to the, to the MedMal business that, that we're a state that's harder to do business in. It, it puts an extra burden on the industry. Now, the committee did not vote on Senate Bill 76 today. Instead, the bill was sent to a subcommittee for further review. The Department of Corrections Commissioner James Donald has a few legislative initiatives that he's pushing for this year. One is an in-house transition center for inmates who are soon to be released, but his primary goal is a work program for inmates which the commissioner says has worked well in South Carolina. David Zelsky has the story on House Bill 58. Good afternoon, man. <laughs> Department of Corrections Commissioner James Donald wants to put his inmates to work, but with pay. For those inmates who volunteer and are DR free, if we get this bill passed, we'll be allowed to work you and then pay you a check. That sounds good? Yes, Phillips State Prison runs a print shop. This shop used to be located at Metro Women's Prison in Atlanta. It's a volunteer only factory right now, but House Bill 58 could change that. But before you pay your check, pay you a check, here's the deal. You, may, you must pay restitution, you must pay for child support, you must give the commissioner and the staff a little bit of money for your room, regardless of how well you like it. This program would also help build a skill set so that there's an option besides crime when the inmate is reintroduced into the community. I think it really would be a, a really good program for them to initiate because there's a lot of men in here that, that don't really have anywhere to go or money to have them to, on a place to stay when they get back out on the streets. In the state of Georgia, when you get out, you get a bus ticket and $25. That's it. Now, obviously, uh, it cost us $18,000 a year to house you here. So in, in many respects, uh, we can't afford much else. It would benefit me a whole lot because I would be able to send money home to help support my children, my fiance. So, yeah, I think it would be a really good program. Obviously, it would help when they discharge to have that money, but also I think it's important that they actually receive something for their work. Uh, it, it's, it helps with their morale. It helps with their self-esteem. If they're being paid for something, then it's a worthwhile job. So what kind of things come out of this prison's print shop? We have your tag verification certificates. We have business cards for House President Pro Tem, Mark Burkhalter. And business cards for the commissioner himself, 
James Donald. I was wondering where these business cards were coming from. Commissioner Donald has met with Labor Commissioner Michael Thurmond about this initiative. And the two agencies have agreed that if House Bill 58 passes, these inmate jobs will not interfere with civilian workers. How would you guys like to be paid for what you do? Reporting for lawmakers, I'm David Zelsky. The South Carolina program, which Commissioner Donald has modeled this bill after, pays the inmates minimum wage. But after victim restitution, child support, and room and board, the inmate receives about 52% of every dollar. Firefighters filled the Capitol today, but thankfully it wasn't in response to smoke or flames. They came instead to celebrate the 33rd annual Firefighters Recognition Day. Lawmakers Michael Riddle has our story. Beginning with the reception in which Insurance Commissioner John Oxendine deputized new fire marshals, the day was spent honoring the important roles firefighters play in the safety of their communities. Governor Purdue welcomed the firefighters. On behalf of all Georgians, I welcome you to the Capitol here today. Thank you for what you do uh, every, each and every day. As you know, most of us hope we never need your services, but we're comforted by the fact that uh, we know you're there. Uh, should we need them, and certainly your business has grown over the last several years as you've gotten more involved in other safe aspects of our life aside from just uh, fighting fires as far as responding of emergencies to any kind, of any kind, and uh, we're glad you're nearby. While there is currently no specific legislation concerning fire safety, Commissioner Oxendine urged those assembled to encourage their legislators to support the new five-year strategic plan which was recently drafted by the Joint Fire Service Legislative Committee. A strategic plan, a five-year plan between now and 2010. We've made Georgia a lot safer with your partnership. Working together a little bit more, we're going to use this plan and we're going to make Georgia the safest state in the union. Secretary of State Kathy Cox also spoke relating that she knew what it meant to be a firefighter. You all hear me talk about this every year, but I have been where some of you are today in working as a volunteer firefighter in Hall County. The day closed with a leisurely parade of firefighting equipment that began at the state capitol and wound through downtown Atlanta. The procession gave citizens a chance to enjoy the vehicles, free of the speed and sirens which normally accompany them. Reporting for Lawmakers, I'm Michael Riddle. Well, coming up tomorrow on Lawmakers, it's Tourism Day at the Capitol, and the Senate is expected to vote on two measures, one dealing with supervision of clinical laboratory technicians. The other measure will revise the Renal Analysis Council. We'll have those stories and all the latest from Under the Gold Dome. That's tomorrow at 7 p.m. on Lawmakers. If you've missed any part of this broadcast, tune in when Lawmakers is rebroadcast tomorrow morning at 5.30 a.m. on GPB. And just a reminder for those of you with access to the Internet, you can watch Lawmakers online. Lawmakers is streamed live and archived on our website every night that we're on the air. Coming up next on Georgia Public Broadcasting, Alan Alda host as Scientific American Frontiers takes a look at cars that think. That program is next here on GPB. <laughs> That's just what we need, cars that think. <laughs> That's our program for this, the 10th legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. Thanks for joining us. I'm Wandy Lawson. And I'm Gerald Bryant. For everyone here at Lawmakers, have a great evening. Good night. of Georgia Public Broadcasting.